Good morning, welcome to you all. Good to see you all here. I see you're wrapped up. It's very cold out, isn't it? But if we sing heartily, uh, it will warm us up, wouldn't it? So that's, that's a good incentive. Um, it's lovely to see you all. A warm welcome. If you're a visitor, do introduce yourself. We love to get to know people. Um, if you are a visitor, you need to lose, go through the glass doors. They're out there. We do have a crash. Um, but you're quite welcome to keep the children in here with you. We understand that they can be a little bit restless, but we can uh, live with that because we want you to feel welcome and, and at home here, so uh, that's most important. Uh, we're going to start our service with a little video. We seem to be doing that lately. Uh, this is about New Wine, which is the summer camp that we go to, and we're inviting everyone to this year. It's in Detling, in Maids near Maidstone. Um, and we just want people to understand what New Wine's about, get a feel for the history of it, why are we investing into this movement as a church. Um, it is a summer camp, but it's also a network of leaders, it's also pastoral support, conferences, it's quite a sort of family, uh, and we get a lot of support from being part of it. So I want you to try and understand a little bit about that. So we'll watch that, and then we'll get into our service proper with some worship. So over to the tech team for our video. Thank you. The story begins with God and his dangerously exciting plan for one faithful family that has impacted thousands. In 1960, God asked David Pitches to leave home and travel seven and a half thousand miles with his wife and young baby to Chile. It wasn't a typical family holiday, but one of adventure, challenge, wonder, and blessing that took them back and forth between Chile and home for 17 years. They experienced earthquakes and a military coup. They battled peritonitis, hepatitis and tuberculosis. In desperation, David's wife Mary cried out to God to be filled with his Holy Spirit, and she experienced the power of his presence for the first time. From that moment on and for the rest of their time in Chile, they saw manifestations of the Holy Spirit, signs and wonders, Together they had a revelation of how the power of the Spirit could impact their homeland and they longed to see God move in the UK. In 1977, they arrived in Chorley Wood to lead St Andrew's Church. When John Wimber brought a team to their church, they began to see the Spirit move as they had seen and heard in South America. Leaders from across the country flocked to see how God was moving. New wine was born. In 1989, families gathered at a showground in Shepton Mallet. The aim was to refresh, inspire and minister in the power of the Spirit, then send out to share what had been experienced and learned. Today, we are a network of thousands of churches across many denominations in 14 countries, and the vision remains the same, to teach and equip local churches in spirit and kingdom principles to see communities impacted by the truth of God's Word and the power of His Spirit. No matter the generation, age, denomination or background, New Wine prepares churches to grasp and bring to maturity the purposes of God, building his kingdom one local church and one willing person at a time. We connect and develop leaders, emerging and experienced. We provide training and events. We create inspiring and practical resources. We support church plants. We unite thousands to worship one. God's kingdom plans are intricately woven and bigger than we will ever know. We are grateful for our inheritance and excited about our future. This is our story so far. Why not join us and be part of the next chapter? Ooh, yeah. There's a story to tell, isn't there? It's quite exciting when you see uh, the story of just a family experiencing God in power, changing their lives, and then sharing that, and like a, a fire that spreads. It has spread, and I think they said, did they say a dozen countries or whatever, that, that, that this just this one, network uh, is working in now and it's not a, a church it's different denominations different churches but it's a network and that can be a powerful thing can't it um, you probably all have different networks that you you're part of uh, friendship circles family circles sports leisure um, but this is our network for our, our church as part still part of the church of england but this is a particular vibrant network that energizes us and helps us so we'll be saying more about this i'll, I'll keep quiet for now and we'll come back to that later in the service um, we're going to stand and sing uh, after the first song the younger children will be going I understand the teens are going to stay in because they're going to see some of our interviews uh, so they'll be staying in but the, the younger groups will go after the first song so let's stand and sing our first song I'll say a prayer for the young people after that and we'll go from there thank you very much
Lord, bless our younger group as they go out now. May they know your presence, you walking with them now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Please sit down. We're going to just say a prayer of confession uh, as our youngsters go. The teens are staying. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> just for now and uh, go out later. So let's say this prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grants that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. And so, my almighty God, uh, who looks upon us with mercy, forgive us from our sins, pardon, forgive us, and grant us new life, and help us walk steadfastly in that life, Lord. Thank you for your forgiveness in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay, we're going to stand and uh, continue in worship, uh, led by Kath and the group. Thank you.
here. Jesus, we thank you that your presence is in your name. When we say the name of Jesus, when we call out to you, Jesus, you're there. You come, you honor that cry, and you presence yourself, and you meet us in our point of need. You'll come to us. Thank you, Jesus. We pray in this service today, we will cry out to you, and we will know you to be there for us, Lord. As we meditate on scripture, as we pray, as we press into your purposes, Lord, may your power and your presence be there because we are calling upon your name now, Lord, collectively, Lord. We're saying, Jesus, come among us by your spirit. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to you, Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Please be seated. We're going to invite Solomon, I think it is, to lead us in some prayers. And then we've got an interview. That's why the chairs are out. But over to Solomon first. Thank you. Shall we pray? What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. Lord, we collectively call upon your name, bow our heads in prayer, Lord, and we ask these. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for this beautiful day and the opportunity for us to gather together in this beautiful church built for us by your children many years ago. As we came this morning to the church, turning from uh, Princess Road to Christ Church Road, we couldn't look up at the beautiful building, all it, in its glory, shining in the sunlight, and uh, I get this feeling, this overwhelming, thankful feeling that this is here for us, so that we can come collectively and worship the Lord. Father, we thank you. Thank you for this opportunity, Lord. And we thank you for your children for continuing to work tirelessly for the upkeep of this church. Please look after them, Father, and bless them and their families, Lord. Lord, we pray for all the leaders of our church who guide us in our spiritual journey. We pray that you keep them safe, meet their needs, and bless them, Lord, so that they can continue to be a blessing to us. Father, we pray for our church family who are here this morning, and also those who are unable to be here for some reason and for those watching this service via the video link. Father, you know the desires of our heart, Lord. We pray that you accept all the prayers that we pour out at your feet. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, hear our call and bless each and every one of us according to your will. Lord, we also have wider family living in different parts of the country or in some cases in different parts of the world. We pray that you keep them under your mighty wings and keep them safe. We pray particularly for those who, are, who have elderly parents living far away from us. Lord, we pray that your blessing be on them. Grant them good health, your peace, and the confidence that you are near them. As I pause, if you have parents or siblings or wider family living far away, and are in need of prayer, please do say a word of prayer for them in your hearts. Lord, we pray for the children who come to Christ Church. All those in school or in university or seeking jobs, working hard. Please grant them the wisdom and help them to focus on the work. Bless their efforts so that they can do well in life. Above all, Father, help them to always walk close to you and know, as, know you as their personal savior. May they grow strong in the faith and shine for your glory. Lord, again, I, as I pause, if you have children and know of any children who need prayers, Please do say a word of prayer for them in your hearts. As we are going to read about Peter being delivered from the prison, help us also to escape from the prison we have put ourselves in 
and the chains we have bound ourselves with. Lord, help each and every one of us to grow spiritually and come closer to you. Help us to press towards the calling of the Christ who died for us, even if it is moving forward an inch at a time, like that beautiful gospel song, inching like a porridge worm. Help our bodies and minds to stay focused and always move forward towards you, Lord, so that we can be true Christians in our hearts. We pray that your Holy Spirit lead us through this service. Help us to recharge our batteries. When we go out, we carry you with us. We ask all this in your precious name, our Father and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I'm going to hand over to Alex, who's prepared a couple of interviews. Thank you. Good morning. Great, there's some people out there. That's good, good. Um, did you know that we have a vision for this church? Does anybody know what that vision is? Richard does. We have a vision that this church is a place of prayer, a place of healing through the power of the Holy Spirit, and a place where disciples are made. Look at your pew sheets. The front of the pew sheet, what does it say there? There's a bit of scripture to be followers of Christ and to make followers of Christ. That's the vision of the church. And one of the ways that we want to encourage the whole church to get on side with that vision is through New Wine United this summer. Um, Jill, why don't you come up? I'm gonna just, we're, we're gonna have a bit of a Q&A session in the new lounge. Put a rug down this week. Hi, Jill. You've been heckled by the audience. Oh, great. Take a seat. I'm sorry, I don't have any coffee. I'll just put coffee out next time. Um, so um, we're just going to sh- um, ask Jill a few questions, um, and then, uh, then we're going to ask Catherine some questions um, in a minute. Uh, but about new wine, just to kind of get a bit more of a flavor. You saw the, pic- the video before, but sometimes it's a lot easier to kind of understand and know what's going on when we ask some questions. So Jill, when was the first time you went to new wine? Um, The first time I went to New Wine was when Michael and I got married 11 years ago. It's something Michael always did, and with his family. And so, of course, when we got married, he said, well, shall we go? And he told me about New Wine. And because I love him, not loved him, but love him, (laughs) because I love him, I said yes, to be honest, and he knows this. I was dreading it. It sounded awful. Thousands of people. When I go on holiday, I like to walk in the wilds of Scotland. Thousands of people in tents. Talks. Boring. I was dreading it. Let's move on to the next question. but what do you now enjoy most about New Wine United? (laughs) By the way, it's not just tents. I keep on plugging. There is a lovely hotel nearby. Yeah, so actually, what I enjoyed most, even though when I first arrived, there were tents and caravans and camper vans and local hotels and bed and breakfasts you could go to, what I actually found was we camped, set up a little camp just with our church family. And what I love is being with our church family, eating with them, having a glass of wine with them, late night coffees and cheese and biscuits. It's lovely. But also, even though there are thousands of the people, you're always standing next to someone in a coffee queue. The coffees are really good. And you just end up chatting and you get to know lots of people. So it's really lovely, lovely to have a chance to get to know people and spend time with them and have some fun with them. But it's not just about that. There was an element of how many thousand people are going to be there? And when you go, there's various options of things to go to during the day. You can either do nothing and sit and sunbathe, or you can go to various talks and seminars. And some of the talks are just with 50 people in. And some of them 
have thousands of people. And I found, even though I didn't want the thousands of people part and wanted to be on my own, I found that I loved being in the big top with thousands of other Christians. And you know how God arranges these things sometimes. The song we have just worshipped is one that always sticks in my mind. Thousands of people singing, what a beautiful name it is, lifting our praise to Jesus. And it is so moving where as one voice we're all worshipping. Fantastic. So I love the people. The worship is second to none. And I'd go there and just worship the whole time because it's so, so beautiful. And in worship, of course, it's not just a matter of singing a song, but it really is a sense of so many people meeting with God, and that's what I did too. And then it goes, come to the boring talks I mentioned earlier. No. <laughs> there was such a range of talks, every aspect about our Christian faith, every aspect about our life, every aspect about church. Now, when I first went, Michael will smile at this, I hope, because I looked at the program and went, oh, I'm going to that, 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 oh my goodness. And I went to so many, it was brilliant. But I've calmed down a bit now. But all these seminars and talks you go to, there are fantastic speakers. They're really funny, they're really engaging. And I have learned so much about my faith it's become broader and far, far deeper because of going to New Wine. And then there's sort of seminars, and probably this, Michael and I would probably vote and say this is our favorite thing. We, every year, we go to a seminar by someone called John Peters, and his seminar is giving us confidence to pray and to minister in the Holy Spirit as we do here. And I know last week, sorry, I'm going on too much. He says, I can carry on. I know last week we talked about praying boldly. And that's easy to say, but when there's someone in front of you and you're thinking, I've got to pray boldly, and you think, oh, I can't. Well, actually, when I've been to New Wine, and we do this every year, we listen to how do we pray, and we practice praying. And it's just wonderful. And my faith has grown hugely deeper. And the confidence in my faith has grown hugely because of going to New Wine. It's lots of fun. It's huge for your faith. And it helps us take our faith into our everyday life in church and with those around us. It really is brilliant. Don't ask me any more questions. I've got enough. You got me at the cheese and wine. <laughs> and you've answered the second question, which would have been, how do you feel when you got home afterwards? And, and that's, that's wonderful. Should we give Jill a round of applause? Thank you, Jill. And um, Catherine, come on to the hot seat. I'm just trying to remember the questions now. Um, so also at New Wine, it is for the whole family, and um, there's a whole thing called Luminosity, which our wonderful Lynn actually heads up. She's part of the team. Can you, what a privilege to have someone on the national leadership of this movement in our church who is, how many thousand young people, Lynn? So that's 4,000 young people have had the privilege and will have the privilege of hearing from Lynn um, this, this summer. So that's one of the reasons why we kept our young folk in this morning, just to hear a little bit about um, all that stuff that goes on. Um, the luminosity is slightly different to... The main stage, it's all youth-focused, run by youth pastors and leaders, um, and it's just an amazing time, and quite vibrant and bouncy and loud. Um, but there are also other venues for um, young people um, and children, and um, Catherine, can, can you just share a bit of your experience about um, the stuff for the younger children? Thank you. Yes, we've been to New Wine since Sam was, I think, maybe two so it's about 22 years ago, and each of our children has gone th to every group. Um, so Sam arrived and went to crash, which I 
think now it might be a whole morning, but when we went, it was half a morning. Um, so we were free to just do whatever we wanted to do. With young children, that, it's a bit more limited, um, but there are things we can do with them later. But with, when they get to school age, um, they're occupied all morning, all evening. Um, so we got to do whatever we wanted to do in those times. And then the afternoons, there's lots of things you can do as a family together. So Richard and I would tend to go to the morning sessions an evening session and then just chill in the afternoon, have a water fight or just sit and uh, get Tim's paddling pool out and just uh, relax together. And um, not only is there something for little ones and, and all kinds of stuff, there's also the additional needs venue. Do you want to talk a little bit about that as well? Um, so as well as using all the um, different age groups, we've used the special needs facility for Tim. Um, there's a place called Our Place, which is one of Tim's favourite places, isn't it? Our Place. Um, he just loves going there. So if the big groups are too noisy for him, he's taken off to Our Place, which is just a lovely sensory room and a quiet place for him. We can also go with him in the afternoon if we want to just have some time um, with, with Tim, uh, we can go there with, as parents with him. And it's a huge support network there, so there's lots of um, activities for the parents. So while Tim's in there, if we were, chose to, we could go to a support group for parents or meet with them for lunch. Um, so the, and the, that's just um, a massive support for us. We've had um, church services there as well, part, part of the... Um, new wine services are at our place uh, so we go there as a family um, so we've benefited each of our children I'd, I'd say that our children's faith has been really impacted certainly my daughter um, stood up as a I think five year old at new wine and became a Christian and I've seen all of my children really grow and change uh, through, through their, their group Tim's now in the teenage group with Lynn which he, he loved, absolutely loved, and didn't actually want to go to our place last year because he was, he was happy in the teenage group. And they provide one-to-one -one for Tim, which is amazing. So he always has somebody with him in those groups too. Great, thank you. I don't think we need to say much more about that. Give Catherine a round of applause. Um, so we see Sunday as a time to get together as the local church and to be revitalized for the week ahead. New Wine is for the national church to come together and be revitalized to come back here and to be sent out into our communities to basically serve those that we love around us. Um, and something extraordinary happens when we get together as one body. You know, when it says in the scriptures that when one or two gather in my name, I am there. Well, when 6,000 gather, it's, yeah, it's an amazing mountaintop experience. So be encouraged. Explore at the back. We've got a notice board with lots of things about new wine. And please do come and ask any of us on leadership about new wine and prices and booking. And if you need help and support with that, we'd love to help you book on. Thank you so much. That's brilliant. And um, um, there are also volunteer places. You can be a team member and basically come for free apart from a, an admin uh, charge to arrange it. So um, come as a volunteer. That's another option to consider. We're going to have some more, some more notices before we move on. Um, tonight, this afternoon, we've got a little concert here. Um, it's in the notice sheet, so do read it. But come along at 5 o'clock if you want to join our concert. Um, Alpha started again on Thursday. There's a one o'clock group and a 7.30 p.m. group. And both were really well attended. I think from what I'm hearing, really good first start. So it's not too late to join those if you want to join that. Um, we mentioned new wine. It's, it's in the notice sheet, some more information about that. Um, we're starting a creative arch project. And John will say more about this next week. But um, on a Monday evening, uh, for several months through to mid-May, we're going to have an arts group. And uh, the idea is that as many of us as possible will produce something. Even if you can only come one week and produce something, 
that would be great because at the end of it we're going to have a huge exhibition this place will be turned into an art gallery and for once in your life you can have your artwork uh, on the wall and show it off and we'll be selling them to to cover the costs and we'll have some special guests here to make a big event of it but we want it to be for all of us but also for friends and community groups so that we're just building bridges uh, uh, with our community and using art and all the creativity that goes with that uh, to, to develop friends and uh, put the church on the map and celebrate God's gift of creativity. So that's on the back of the notice sheet. There's a lot of things happening in February, folks. Prayer events. Uh, please read through. There's a, there's a specific prayer event for, for the cost of living crisis. There's a prayer event that uh, Alex is going to lead on the 1st of February, not that far away. Um, so please read those things as well. Uh, that's the notices for now. Thank you. One more notice is just to say, I think we still need a little bit more help with coffee. I think we've got Julian and Ben. Do we, do we need another one? Oh, okay. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. <laughs> so let's collect our offering. What we do in church nowadays, uh, if you're not aware, is we invite people to put the money in the plate as they come in or as you go out. We'll bring that forward uh, and we'll say a prayer. Well, we're not passing the plate round, but we're just uh, collecting money in that way if you want to give to our work to keep this place running. So let's invite that offering forward and then we'll say a prayer together. Please stand for this. Thank you. Thank you. Let's say this prayer together. We offer you, Lord, these our gifts. The money we offer now and the donations received online. Receive them and bless them in your service. And bless us to the givers, that with lives laid down before you, we may bring you glory through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for your generosity. Thank you. Please be seated. I'm going to ask Daisy to read our Bible lesson. Thank you. The reading is taken from Acts chapter 12, verses 1 to 19. Peter's miraculous escape from prison. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. When he saw that this met with approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter too. This happened during the festival of unleavened bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by the four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared and light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrists. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals, and Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea what the angel was doing was really happening. So he thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself and when they went through it. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord had sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. 
Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant named Rhoda came to answer the door. When he recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter is at the door. You are out of your mind, they told her. Then she kept insisting that it was so, they said it must be his angel. But Peter kept on knocking, and when they opened the do door and saw him, they were astonished. Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet and described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Tell James and the other brothers and sisters about this, he said, and then he left for another place. In the morning, there was no small commotion among the soldiers as to what had become of Peter. After Herod had gone, had a thorough stretch, search made for him and did not find him, he cross-examined the guards and ordered that they be executed. Then Herod went to, from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to I'm going to hand over to Michael, who's going to share with us uh, some thoughts from that passage. Thank you. Good morning. Um, we're going to carry on from what we were singing about, about how the name, the power in the name of Jesus and how he can break every chain. And I was trying to think about, as, as you those of you that have heard me talk before, you know that I, I sort of like pictures. Um, so if we can go over and see if this is going to work for me. And of course it's not. Well, that bit is, this bit isn't. I will get the remote control to work in a minute. Um, I was trying to think of some sort of picture. Um, and interestingly, if you put prison break into Google, the only thing you get are pictures of the television series, which I'd vaguely heard of but knew nothing about. So, sorry, you've got a picture. Um, let's have a bit of a background, first of all, to where we are in the story. It was a discouraging time for the church in Jerusalem. Herod mentioned here is Herod Agrippa I, who apparently was the nephew um, of Herod Antipas, who had had John the Baptist beheaded, and he was the grandson of Herod the Great. Herod appeared to be a, a serious family name, I think it's fair to say. Um, this particular Herod had been appointed by the Romans to be in charge of Palestine, and because he did it well, his power grew and he was given more bits of land to cover. And it ended up that actually at this point in time, he ruled the largest realm of any man since his grandfather. So he was doing really well. And one of the reasons he was doing well was because he knew how to make the Jewish authorities happy. And that appeared to be by getting rid of any Christians. You know, he started off, this, this usurper, Jesus, let's get rid of him. Oh, they like that. And then it starts growing from that. Um, and he realised that he was building his power base by persecuting Christians. So by this point, he had had James arrested and had had him executed because that had gone down so well, he decided he'd get Peter arrested with the same plan in mind. So here we are. He'd had Peter arrested for nothing other, no crime other than being a Christian. And he had a plan to behead him. And now, the prison, let's see if I can move this so I don't have to keep bending down. Without unplugging everything. Here we go. 
orchids. Right, this is a genuine Roman prison cell in Ephesus. I suspect the only bit that isn't genuine is that when it was used as a prison cell, it probably didn't have little pots of plants in it, um, as in the picture. Um, But Herod really wanted this to go well, so he had made sure that this one prisoner was well guarded. He had 16 soldiers guarding him. Three shift, or four shifts of four guards at a time, which apparently was unusual. But they obviously wanted to make sure he, was where he stayed in prison. Now, don't forget, he'd already, I think Sharon mentioned it when she talked last week, Peter had already walked out of prison once. So Herod this time wanted to make sure he got it right and he did not get away. So there was nothing for the church to do apart from pray. And apart, we say that, there's nothing they could do apart from pray. And yet... Praying, surely, was the biggest thing. But what do you think they were praying for? If I was them, I wouldn't mind thinking that they were not praying for him to be released. Luke is very good at telling stories and if they were praying for his release, that is what they would, he would have written. But what he wrote was they were praying earnestly for Peter. They were not, they were probably thinking, we know what Herod's going to do, what are we going to do as a church when another one of our leaders has gone? Let's pray for him. They were not bold prayers. They were asking to be sustained and maintained. And how often are we like that? That actually we aren't bold. We don't like being specific in our prayers, just in the off chance that it doesn't happen. We get into a muddle about what we want and what we think is best and what God thinks is best and so we dumb down what we pray for. So often we assume our prayers aren't going to be answered because they might not have been answered in the past exactly as we expected them to be. Sometimes sometimes we ask for very little because we're, that's all we feel we're strong enough to pray for. But then we're disappointed that God doesn't give us more. We ask for a little, but actually hope for a lot, but we don't ask for it. And then we're disappointed that we don't get what we didn't ask for. You know. But that's what this church, these, these Christians were doing. But on the other hand... Let's look at Peter in prison. The night before Herod was brought, going to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping. Now, hands up, how many of you really worried about what's going to happen tomorrow? It's going to change your life, possibly end your life, and you go to sleep nicely. You know? But that says what Peter was like with God. He didn't know what was going to happen tomorrow, but he knew that God was with him. So he had a level of faith that allowed him to sleep. And when we read the story, what happens next in the story, I'm sorry, is is just comedy in many ways. And to help, if any of you have ever seen this, if you have never seen it, 
Google Lego Testament and someone has spent hours making stories of the Bible stories in Lego and taking photos of them and putting them on the website. It, it's hilarious. But, so, God's timing, of course, worked perfectly. We have Peter chained in prison with a guard on either side, sleeping, and an angel appears. And then, what does it say? Wake up. Nothing happens. So the angel has to hit Peter to wake him up. So he was that well asleep. You know? He's not oh, dozing slightly. Oh, hello. No, he has to be hit to be woken up. So he was well gone. He's then told to get dressed, put his coke and sandals on, and get up and go with him. So this fisherman who was used to being really in charge and knowing things had to be led along like a little child put your coat on, put your shoes on we're going outside you know and they're led through the gates and outside and then the angel disappears and he stands there, Peter stands there and says oh oh it actually happened. Um, he did not expect God to do this, but he was sort of, oh, oh, I need to tell someone about this. And so he, he rushes off to tell the people who were at Mary's house. Now, Mary's house is where they think now was where the upper room was. So this was obviously the place that Christian, the, the fellowship gathered. So they went there and he knocked on the door. And we get this thing about they are praying so hard for his release. And actually they're praying and then someone starts knocking on the door. What on earth is this person doing, disturbing us, praying for Peter? So they send a servant to open the door, see it is. And he hears, she hears him shouting out, saying, let me in, I'm here. And she gets so filled with excitement that she doesn't actually bother to open the door. She just turns around and rushes back in to tell the people who are praying that their prayers have been answered and he's at the door. And... Their response is really good. You've lost your mind. The phrase in, in we have, you're beside yourself, is what we're told. Apparently the words mean, not don't be stupid, it's no, you have completely lost your marbles. You are wrong. Your mind's gone. They were really quite rude to this poor lady. Say, so, you know, it can't possibly be him. Or it might, if it is, it might be his angel, which either means, probably they, had, they believed in guardian angels. So it could well have been a guardian angel, in which case that probably means that Herod's already done and killed him off, if the guardian angel isn't with Peter. So, no, you've definitely got it wrong. So Peter... So, so these, these guys really did expect the worst to happen. And they could not be convinced that they were wrong. Until someone actually says, oh, we'll have to go and do it. He's making so much noise, banging on the door so much, we can't keep praying. He's distracting us. Go and open the door just to put him, tell him to be quiet. So someone goes and opens the door, and there is Peter. And they sort of go, oh, fancy that. And I suspect they didn't believe him. Even then, you know, is this really you? Are you not an angel? 
and he tells them to shut up and be quiet. And I hope he was telling them to be quiet because they were so excited rather than they still didn't believe. But I don't know. I don't know quite what I'd have thought under those circumstances. But you have to feel sorry for Peter standing outside banging on the door because not only does he want to get in, but actually he knows he's an escaped prisoner. And sooner or later, the guards are going to come looking for him. And here he is, stuck outside the door in the street. And, you know, poor man, he's in a bit of a state. But you hear all this story and you think, this is, this is an old, a, a New Testament miracle. But let's put it in context. He could not believe that he could get out of prison. He couldn't even open the door without someone coming to help him. And they didn't expect it to happen. So these are very, very ordinary, normal people. They're the same as us. They're not special people. So it's a, it's a funny story. But it's written with humour so that we get the point, I think. We realise that these are ordinary people. Have you ever been so excited about something that you sort of run around in the circle not quite sure what to do with yourself? Who, you want to tell people about it but you don't know what to do. But that's actually what the servant girl was like. Peter had turned up at the door and she was so excited she didn't act rationally anymore. She didn't open the door and let him in. But she was excited about what had happened. But this still leaves difficult questions. Why did God allow James to die and yet save Peter? Why is one child disabled and another child athletically gifted? Why do people die before realising their potential? Questions that we can't answer. Because we don't know the big picture. We don't know God's plan. We struggle and we don't because we don't know what the answer is and it's very easy to stop asking because we don't know what the answers will be. But God does act. God does have a plan. God does do things. He strengthens us. He brings us things that bring glory to him. And in the meantime, all we can do is just pray and ask and hope. Those early disciples prayed for strength and support for Peter. And they got Peter back as their leader. The power of prayer is immense. We mustn't underestimate it. But let's go back to the start of the story. Peter is in prison. Now realistically, it's highly unlikely in this country, in this day and age, that any of us will end up in prison because of our faith. But that doesn't mean that none of us are going to be in prison, metaphorically, in our lives. There are going to be things that are locking us in, stopping us from being free, stopping us from being and the people that God made us to be. And the same 
God that opened the prison doors for Peter can open the prison doors in our lives and bring us freedom. And while the story of the disciples praying earnestly and receiving more than they expected is is a significant part of the story this morning. I think almost the bigger part for me when I was reading it is that God freed Peter from his prison, from a prison that seemed inescapable. And I wonder how many of us feel just a bit at times that we are enclosed in something that we can't get out of, that's limiting who we are, stopping us being the person that God created us to be. And I think from the power of prayer, we need to ask God to free us from that. We cannot do it in our own strength. Peter could not escape from those, that cell in his own strength. But through the power of God and through the Christians meeting together to pray for him, he found freedom. And I think we need to find that freedom. We need to talk and share our our struggles with our Christian family that Jill was talking about. And ask for prayer. And be excited rather than surprised when we find freedom. So let's pray. Father, thank you that you can break every chain, open prison doors, let the captive be free. Father, these are words that we sing so often, but help them to be true and real in our lives, personally. Lord, I pray for anyone who's hearing what I'm saying to hear what you're saying to them and accept your offer of freedom. Help us to support each other, to pray for each other in our need. But Lord, make these more than just words that we sing, but an experience in our lives as you break the chains in our lives. Amen. Thank you, Michael. Um, well, let's carry on in that attitude of, of prayer. Um, I'm going to ask Catherine and the, the group gently, first of all, just to play some music, and then we'll, we'll turn it into a, a congregational song in just a second. Um, so Michael was praying for us to, if we feel uh, chains, to, to be set free. I do want to give that opportunity if anyone wants to come forward for prayer to do so. Um, Perhaps we'll do that during the song. Um, So we'll stand in a second and sing, but if you would like prayer, just come forward. We'll pray for you at the front. Um, Perhaps Michael and Jill could join me if anyone comes forward. 
Um, it might be for yourself, it might be a family member on your heart that you see, when you look at them, you see them imprisoned, literally or spiritually, um, and it's just an opportunity to pray. So let's take advantage of those opportunities. Uh, so let's stand and sing. Um, Please stand. <laughs> uh, the song is going to be, is it, I'll give you all the honour, is that the one you've prepared or are you going to? I'll give you all the honour. Yeah, so we'll sing this song. But please, uh, could you just start first of all just with the chords, just, just help us get into the, the place of focusing on God.
have broken chains. You have broken chains that bound me. You've set this captive free. I will lift my voice to praise your We lose so much of life because we don't ask God to fear us. I think too often we accept that what is going on is part of God's plan. And sometimes we need to challenge that. God wants us to be the people he made us in his image. And if we're feeling tied down by fear or anything else, then I don't believe we're being the people God made us to be. So maybe after communion, if you come up for communion, and you still want to be prayed for, we'll be in the, stand in the chapel and just stop off in the chapel on your way back to your pew and we'll pray then. Yeah, it's a good idea. If Michael and Jill could come up fairly early to get your bread and wine yourself, then you can go over and pray for anyone else. I, was, I think I agree with Michael. Um, communion in itself uh, is a great opportunity to receive from God so bring those burdens when you come forward for communion receive that sign which um, the bread and wine are a sign of deliverance aren't they um, of being set free receive that but then by all means do have some top up prayer and pray in to break those chains okay let's make the most of these opportunities as we gather uh, each week we're going to continue our service now with the, the peace and then move into our communion uh, so as we're here together, may the peace of the Lord be always with you and also with you. Let's offer each other a sign of peace. Thank you.
be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is right to praise you, Father, Lord of all creation. In your love you made us for yourself. When we turned away, you did not reject us, but came to meet us in your Son. You embraced us as your children and welcomed us to sit and eat with you. In Christ you shared our life, that we might live in him and he in us. He opened his arm of love upon the cross and made for all the perfect sacrifice for sin. On the night he was betrayed at supper with his friends, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His body is the bread of life. At the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His blood is shed for all. As we proclaim his death and celebrate his rising in glory, send your Holy Spirit that this bread and this wine may be to us the body and blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy gifts, make us one in Christ, our risen Lord. With your whole church throughout the world, we offer you this sacrifice of praise and lift our voice to join the eternal song of heaven, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Let's sit and kneel as we say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. Draw near with faith, receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Please do come forward to receive the bread and wine, or if you just want a blessing, keep your hands down, and I'll say a prayer for you. Thank you. Let's uh, say together the prayer of thanksgiving. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Stand for our final song, And Can It Be. Thank you.
Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, that you set us free from our prisons, Lord. May we go now as your free people to spread that gospel of, of freedom, of liberation, Lord. Uh, and may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. God bless Amen. you all. Thank Amen. you.